Good evening, all. Welcome on board, and please allow me to start off my presentation immediately, because I want to get to the Q&A, a.k.a. my favorite part of every talk. So, as you can see, we have a mind map. This is basically is a projection of how I think, what is going on inside my mind. My mind. So, let me walk you through the mind map. As you can see, we have the world map. Uh, first of all, we'll speak about China. Between 2002 and 2011, $1.08 trillion left China. I'm going to tell you left to, to where. The, we, because we have a departure, of course, we have to have an arrival. $880.96 billion left Russia. Hold on, we have more destinations. $461.86 billion left Mexico. 266.43 billion dollars left Saudi Arabia. 343.93 billion dollars left India. And 343.93 dollars again left Malaysia. Now we have an exclamation mark. Probably now you all are wondering. I have mentioned the word left, 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 and left more than one time. Logically, when you leave as a person, when you leave a destination, you have to have an arrival destination. So here comes the role of Hong Kong and Macau. In the law scheme, in the money laundry scheme, we have a term of art for these countries. They are called uh, safe havens. They are also called the uh, uh, the Republic of Peoples of off Offshore. So they are the recipients of the money laundry, of the money laundry that is departing from Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, India, and the countries that I have just mentioned. The process that I'm just explaining now have, have a name in law. It is money laundry. That is the example. That is how we can imagine money laundry. But we have to have, an, we have, to have a definition for money laundry. So what is money laundry? The definition of money laundry at its simplest form is an, an amount of money leaving from destination A, but in real life, people think that it came from destination B. In other, in other words, it is the process where criminal use, uh, use the techniques to, to, disguise, to disguise the origin of money obtained through illegal activities, so it looks like that it has been obtained from legal activities. In the, simplest in the simplest words, it's money detergent, so you just wash the money and make it look like that it has been obtained from a legal source. So with a little financial detergent, your dirty money can be rendered more or less untraceable. They cannot trace back the source of the money. Now, now we know what is money laundry. We have to know how it's carried on. In academia, we have three main stages. The first stage is placement. The second stage is uh, layering. The third stage is integration. What do you mean by placement? At this stage, the launderer inserts dirty money into a legitimate financial institution, aka banks. So we have to know that is the riskiest uh, stage in money laundry. Why? Because it is easy to get caught, and especially in this uh, stage. Let us take an example. If I had one million, 100, 100 million bucks, and I want to use it, and I want to launder the money. So the first stage I'm, that I'm going to go through is placement. I'm going to deposit the money in bank account. But if I'm really clever money launderer, I'm going to deposit the bank account in more than one bank. Let us say I deposited 10,000 Qatari Rial in HSBC, then another 10,000 in QMB, and etc. So that's how it works, the first stage. Uh, the second stage is layering. As we all know and mentioned, it is layering. Uh, it is basically sending money through various fin financial transactions. We have examples. You can change currencies. You can get your money and deposit it in more than one bank account outside the country, not inside the country. You can also purchase, purchase expensive goods like cars and houses. So it's like you're telling the launderer, be creative. Be creative and it's scattering your money all over the country or all over the world. The last uh, the last stage in money laundry is integration. Here at this stage, you are basically re-injecting the money in the mainstream of economy. 
How it's done, let us take the example that we have just mentioned in layering. In, uh, in layering. We said you can buy expensive cars or houses. Here you can sell the car and houses and enjoy your money freely without the fear of getting caught. So your money could, cannot be traced back to its origin. So now you're safe and sound at this stage. Now that we have known what is money laundry and this, how it's carried on, we will move to the next point, which is the application on money laundry stages. I have an objective from this point. I've just mentioned the stages, I said it's in academia. So we have, it is lifeless and solid. We have to have an example in order to make it lively. So the, uh, the famous example about money laundry is the famous case of uh, Franklin Dorado. It was, uh, it was in 1980, and uh, between 1980 and early 90s. So allow me to read out from the slides because I'm a lawyer, and you know lawyers are really precise, and I cannot breach intellectual property. So this is directly from a book, so allow me to read it, please. In the late 1980s and early 90s, Harvard-educated economist Franklin Jurado ran an operation to launder money for a Colombian drug lord. His family name is Londono. He was a very complex scheme. In its simplest form, the operation went something like this. So now we have a live application about the stages of money laundry. A placement went like this. So Gerardo deposited cash from U.S. drug sales in Panama bank accounts. So he used the first stage. He deposited the money from his country to Panama. In layering, he then transferred the money from Panama to more than 100 bank accounts. See, he scattered the money all over the world. And you can see it is 68 banks in nine countries in Europe. Always in transaction under $10,000. $10,000. Why is that? Because we know when you deposit money here in Qatar, you have to fall under the, uh, there's a ceiling, you have to fall under it. And even in the US. So that's why he was really clever and he remained under the ceiling, $10,000, uh, uh, to avoid suspicion. The bank accounts were in, in made up names and names of Londono's mistresses and family members. Dorado then set up shell companies. We will speak about shell companies later on in Europe in order to, to document the money as leg legitimate income. The last stage, integration, the plan was in this stage is to send money to Colombia, where, where Londono would use it to fund his numerous legitimate businesses, because now he's safe and sound. He can use the money, it's already clean and white. But Dorado, Dorado got caught in total uh, because he funneled three, 36 million in drug money through a legitimate financial transaction. Now the outcome of the entire case. Dorado's scheme came to light when Mon uh, Monaco Bank collapsed. Actually, an auditor, an auditor caught, uh, caught him. Uh, and, the uh, and the subsequent audit revealed numerous accounts that could be traced back to Dorado. At the same time, Dorado's neighbor in Luxembourg filed a nose complaint because Dorado had a money counting machine. Yes, <laughs> he had a money counting machine, and that's how he got caught. Um, a money counting machine running all night, so that was the source of the noise. Local authorities investigated, and the Luxembourg court ultimately found him guilty of money laundering. When he, when he finished serving his time in Luxembourg, another court caught him in the US, found him guilty too, and sentenced him to seven years and a half in prison. So ultimately he got caught, finally. <laughs> now that we're, we're done from the academic, solid, pure legal ways of money laundry, I feel it's an obligation on me to explain money laundry in a simpler way, in a, plain English and plain friendly way, plain English. So I'm gonna speak plain English, no legalese here. Money laundry in real life could be carried using techniques, four main techniques. The first technique is the little blue man. Uh, I bet you all know the Smurfs. Do you know the Smurfs? The little innocent, adorable creatures. In the financial sectors, they are not so innocent. Why? Because what do you mean by Smurf? Smurf in uh, the financial sector. They are the little guys who's helping the big guys in the business, the money launderers. So they basically are the ones who carry on the little deposit, the little tiny deposit day to day, the day to day transactions. So that's why they are not so innocent. The second technique is, the go is going corporate. What do you mean by going corporate? 
basically the big guys or the money launderer experts wouldn't choose the uh, little blue man technique. They would go for the second technique. Why? Uh, because here they can establish the shell companies. I just spoke earlier about the shell companies. Through the shell companies, they could get bribes, kickbacks, which is worth more than the technique of you were to choose uh, the Smurfs. So you can have bribes, kickbacks using the shell company. What is a shell company in a nutshell? Shell company is it is a it is a company that exists only on papers. They don't have a, phys a real physical existence in real life. Although there are exceptions, but let us stick to the main broad uh, definition of uh, shell company. The third technique is say it with diamonds. We all know that diamonds are ladies' best friend, but they are the government, the government's worst nightmare. Why is that? Let us take an example. For example, I want I have a 100 million uh, box. I want to give that 100 million box to the U.S. How may I do that? I'm a lady, so I can choose a nice necklace and wear it and just pass the customs with no taxes, no deduction, because it's my thing. So this is, uh, actually, I'm getting this technique because I've read statistics. Recent statistics shows that many people in real life are using this uh, technique, say it with diamonds. The last, and the, the last technique is trouble ahead. Basically, this is a not, not a technique, it is a fact. It's, it's a piece of advice. Now we're being negative, we're saying money laundry. Mo dirty money is moving from one destination to another destination freely. There is no, nothing, nobody's acting, nobody's acting positively toward this problem. Yet, uh, investigations show that the uh, good, it, it is hard to find good banks. And when I say good banks, I don't mean banks that have sophisticated security measures. I'm referring to the banks that I mentioned earlier in Macau and Hong Kong, the safe havens. So now money launderers are struggling in finding good banks. You cannot find good banks. Therefore, the big fishes, the expert money launderers, are easy to are getting caught using the uh, dragnets because we're calling them the big fishes. So now they are really, we, you can, uh, they are getting caught really easily through the dragnet. So now that we're done with the uh, official way of uh, explaining the, how money laundry is carried on, uh, how money laundry is carried on in real life, we have to know what is the effects of money laundry. So what, what, what are the results of having a crime of money laundry? There are three basic general effects of money laundry. The first one, uh, which is really sad fact, criminal activities does pay off. The second one is inflation. The third one is drug trafficking. Each and every, each and every point have, have an explanation, of course. The first one, as, as we know, we all know money laundry is the process of cleaning the dirty money and making it look like as it was obtained from a legal activity. So, it is a really sad truth that criminal activity does pay off. Why? Because the launderer money is now clean and white. So the huge untraceable amount of money is a valuable asset that the launderer can enjoy freely without the fear of getting, of be, of getting caught. The second, uh, the second uh, effect is inflation. The economic effects are on broader scale. Why? Because developing countries bear the dirty money because their government are still struggling. They are still in the process of establishing regulation for their newly privatized financial sectors, which makes them vulnerable, weak, weak countries. So they are the prime target for launderers. Thus, it causes some errors in the economic, in the economic policy as the banks collapses in that part of the world, resulting in a form of artificially inflated financial sectors. So we're talking about the developing countries, uh, like in Africa, middle of Africa, and West Africa, some of, uh, com some of countries that is located in West Africa. That is based on some statistics that I have read before uh, in the World Bank. The last uh, effect of money laundry is drug trafficking. What do we mean by drug trafficking? Investigations show that money laundry has two prime industries. The first one is drug trafficking, the second one is uh, terrorist organization. If we were to trace back money laundry to its original history, it all started from a drug trafficking case, and surprisingly, it ended the same way. So among the serious triggers of money laundry is drug trafficking. So the effect of drug trafficking is as simple as that. We started from the, a point, and we ended in, this, in the same point. So the departure point and the arrival point are the same point, which is drug trafficking. 
After laying out the serious effects of money laundering, it's time to explore what have, what have been done to, uh, to tackle this issue, what have been done to solve this problem. We will, we will explain this uh, we will explain this point through two stages. The first stage is in the national, on the national level. The second stage is on the international level. When I say the national level, we all know that Qatar is a civil law country. So everything is basically codified. And I'm carrying between my hands, th that was the solution in Qatar. Law number four of 2010. Uh, this law speaks about or tackle the problem of money laundry, the title of its combating money laundry and terrorism financing law. So it was issued in 2010. But based on my studies, because I'm, I already wrote a book about money laundry, the accurate kickoff of this law started in 2007. And I call 2007 the, the year of the awakening call. Why is that? Because precisely in this year, Qatar got its first uh, evaluation report from the FATF. I'm going to explain later what is the FATF. So uh, the, uh, the, real, the actual date of this law was in, back in 2007, where Qatar got its first evaluation report. This report basically assesses the local laws and how it's dealing with the financial sector. It, it deals with the abuses of the financial sector. It assesses the law, whether it's good law or weak law, and if it was complied to the international standard or not. So, unfortunately, the, uh, the result of this, uh, of this evaluation report was not really satisfying. So that's where the awakening call year came from, the name of the uh, year. So it was basically an awakening call for Qatar. Right after this evaluation, they sought the uh, technical assistance from the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and they sent a technical assisting team to Qatar. Eventually, in 2010, they had law number uh, 4 of 2010. So uh, it is a collective uh, effort between the Qataris and people from the IMF. This law has 10 chapters. Uh, 83 articles. Chapter 1 discusses uh, general definitions uh, in finance and law. Chapter 2 discusses uh, the... Um, it is more specialized. It talks about money laundering and terrorism financing. Chapter 3 talks about the disclosures to customs. Chapter 4 talks about the NAMLEC. What is the NAMLEC? The NAMLEC is the N National Anti-Money Laundering Committee. Then shortly after, chapter, uh, chapter 5 talks about the FIU, the Financial Information Unit which I call in my own terms, it's, it is the lab, the kitchen, because they are carrying most of the job. They are receiving the STRs, the suspicious transaction reports. They are, uh, they are the ones who are recommending the NAMLEC what to do. So they are the main, the main, uh, the focal point for all authorities around the country. Everything is done in the FIU. Uh, the sixth point is the preventive measure. The seventh point is sup the supervising authorities like the QFC, uh, Qatar Central Bank, and uh, the eighth chapter talks about investigation procedures, so here we're referring to the public persecution. The ninth chapter talks about international co cooperation. What do we mean by international co cooperation? We are talking about extradition, so how countries can cooperate if we have a launderer in Qatar. Are we allowed to, extra, uh, to use the extradition mechanism and depart him to India, let's say to India? So this chapter deals with, uh, with international cooperation. The last chapter deals with penalties. Basically, if you laundered money, you either have to pay a fine or you go to jail. In law number four of 2010, the, there is a ceiling. There is a ceiling. Uh, the fine could reach up to two, uh, two million uh, Qatar riyal. The imprisonment, uh, when you go to jail, it varies. It depends on the, it, uh, it's case by case. You sometimes could be sentenced to 10 years, sometimes to seven years. So it, uh, it's a case by case uh, situation. Now that we're done with the, uh, the uh, national side of how Qatar fought money laundry, we will move to the international side of it. So basically you can see here the FATF and the USA. The main point is the FATF. What do I mean by FATF? FATF is the, is, is the Financial Action Task Force. What is the FATF? It's an intergovernmental body and it's a policy making body. So basically, in my own terms, I call them the people who, who drafted the mother law of money laundry. Why I'm saying the mother law? Because each country that has an agreement with this organization, that has signed the agreement with FATF, should, the local law should be compliant with the, uh, with the FATF standards. 
So the FATF standards are also known as the FATF recommendations. The FATF recommendations are 40. There are 40, there are 40 recommendations dealing with everything that has to do with money laundry. Uh, extradition, exchange of information. Uh, it has basically two main uh, objectives, to assess the local law and to point out or shed the light on uh, drawbacks in the law. It doesn't stop here. They also provide solutions, way outs from those drawbacks. There were, uh, there were 40 recommendations up until 911 which is the 911 incidents in the US. After the 911, we had plus nine. So there were, ex there were extra nine recommendations dealing with uh, terrorism financing. Because you, can, you, can all, you all can relate 911 and the, uh, the, the topic or the theme of the special nine recommendation. It all, it, it all deals with uh, terrorism financing. Uh, you can all notice that when I said we'll tackle the fight against money laundry internationally, I said FATF than the U.S. I mentioned the U.S. because I feel it is not fair to, t to speak about Qatar and internationally it would be really broad. So I have to have an example. And one of the reasons I chose the U.S. because I worked there. So I know how I know the money laundry system, how it works, how it's how people in the U.S. are functioning. So in the U.S., they have what is called the Patriot Act. We're not talking about the Patriot Act in whole. We are talking about Title III. Title III deals with money laundry and terrorism financing. But the, fights, the fight against money laundry started from the 20s, the, f the entire idea of fighting money laundry. Officially, it started in the 1970s. Uh, what I mean by officially, that when they started drafting laws and having real thing. The first real thing was the Bank Secrecy Act, 1970. Then later on, they, have, uh, they had the uh, Money Laundry Suppression Act in 1986. Then they had the Money Laundry Control Act in 1994. And finally, eventually, they had the Patriot Act that I just spoke about in 2001. Uh, and one of the triggers was also the 911 incidents. So all in all, that's my um, my mind map, which sounds, which looks like as a mess, but is my beautiful mess. The, that is my beautiful mess, and I guarantee you all that if you looked back at this at this map, you would all you would uh, all carry the uh, key concepts of money laundry. So why not? If we, if I pass this uh, this mind map between the audience, we could fight money laundry together because this uh, this. Precise might have everything that has to do with money laundry, the key concepts. And this uh, entails uh, the other point that, I, that is on the top of my mind. I really want to say this because the, the first plan, plan A, was to do a, legal, a pure legal money laundry talk. But then it came to my knowledge that my audience are from a non-legal background, so I used plan B, which is money laundry 101. <laughs> so that is one reason I did the mind map. Uh, up until this point, I'm done. But before wrapping up, I have I have a couple of notes. I would really like to thank my mother because she took she took the time and attended my lecture. My parents, actually, my both of my parents are here. Uh, please join me in uh, thanking Dr. Reema Lansari for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. So much.